Well, welcome everyone. I'm Annie Madrala, for those that I haven't met yet, and I'm on our teaching team. And today we are going to be, um, and we're in our seventh module of Raising Virtuous Children. Our topic is, what are healthy rhythms for our families? And so as we get started, um, let's just open in a word of prayer. Father, we come to you and we know that you created the rhythms of creation around us. The sun rises and it sets. That each day we have a new um, opportunity to wake with you, to walk with you, and to lay our heads down at night and trust you. God, I pray that this message be one of encouragement, hope, and, uh, and just some practical tools that um, as moms we can um, implement in our homes. As we seek to glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so if I want to get to know you, I'm going to ask you the question, what do you desire? Not what do you know, but what are you dreaming about? What are you longing for? You may struggle to answer this because you may know the answer you want to say, but it's conflicting with your heart. Um, Maybe you've never really considered what you desire. You're just living out your life based on the, what's expected of you. So, I was getting my hair colored the other day and I um, was talking with my colorist about this idea that we're desiring beings. And she said, yeah, that makes sense. She said, like, I come to work because I desire security. And I was like, Lindsay, you're a genius. Yes, I need that for my, my lesson. Um, a consistent paycheck that helps her to pay her bills and take care of her uh, daily needs. Now, she is excellent at her job, and I think she does like it, but the thing that drives her, motivates her to show up, is not the fact that she's going to see me every six weeks and color my gray, but that, um, that security that she is getting through her, her job. Various desires motivate the same occupation. Someone might be a lawyer because she wants to have wealth, and the good material life, she wants financial independence. That might be her desire. Maybe she wants to be a lawyer because she got a lot of approval as a teenager or in school because of her logic and reasoning skills, the approval of her parents. So her motivation is actually the approval of others. Or maybe she's experienced injustice and wants to either advocate for the oppressed or see the guilty punished. Either way, her motivation is a desire for justice. You see, we can do the same thing, but our desire, our motive could be different. And so various desires motivate us. People think, say we're thinking beings, just like Descartes said, I think, therefore, I am. We all know it, but really it's not true. Scripture is clear that we are not vessels of information. Instead, we are vessels of formation. We are designed to be transformed into the image of God through a relationship with Him. Candace challenges to write our family mission statement. The goal in doing this was to aim our family's decisions and direction, our traditions, in the direction of the things that we value the most. The things that we love, that we desire. As Christians, we love God. And so we're aiming our families towards His kingdom. By design, we're fundamentally creatures of desire. We're lovers. We, what we love tends to orient our behavior and our choices in the direction of that love. St. Augustine famously wrote, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in you. As imagers, image bearers of God, Himself. It makes sense that we are creatures of love because love is what God is and what drives and motivates Him. So it makes sense that we are formed by our loves. So if Augustine is right and our hearts are restless and wandering around, testing the various things that could satisfy that, we're in, we, we could be adrift in chaos until we find Him. Satan himself has worked very diligently to pattern the world on, oh, around the loves of anything that does not direct us towards the kingdom of God. The ways, of the, and the, the ways and practices of the world teach us what? They teach us that work, education, athleticism, travel, beauty, success, approval, recognition, and on and on and on 
should be the aim of our lives. Now, these things actually can be good things when they're aimed towards the glory of God. But Satan and the sin-infected world has distorted these things to be for our kingdoms and not the kingdom of God. Jesus was clear that the coming kingdom is directly opposite of the images the world presents. The poor in spirit, the humble, those who mourn, those who are persecuted. Those are the ones that receive the kingdom of God. So our series verse, we've talked about this every week, we put it up on the screen, is Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 through 9. God really made it clear to me today that what we need to do is we need to start there and we need to unpack what that is. So on your, um, on your sheets, we're going to go through this passage of scripture and I'm going to kind of explain a little more in detail what this is about. So our series, uh, the verse begins with what? Hear, O Israel. So right away, the first word here, actually translated in Hebrew, is the word Shema. And actually, that is what this passage is referenced, often called as the Shema, because the first word is Shema. Here, this word here um, is not like our English word here. Hear or listen, it can be translated. It is actually a call to action. It means to hear or listen and then go and obey. Pay attention and respond with action. It's not passive hearing, but one that requires an active response. That's the next thing. Candice, can you go forward? Listen, okay. Respond with action. We're not passive in this. Give me a second. All right, so then moving forward, it says, Hear, O Israel. Who is Israel? We're like, I'm not Israel. But really, oh, Israel is a call to action for the nation of Israel, but today it's really a call to God's family. So this is Jew and Gentile alike. All God's children. Here. Okay, I gotta stay back. I'm getting in trouble. <laughs> Here, oh Israel. So, first five gets straight to the point with this message that God has given Moses. It says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. This is an imperative statement. This command is rooted in total love and devotion to God. So go to the next one. And keep going. This gets straight to the point. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now, the word love here, this is really important. Okay, and I think I, my slide is a little, a little off. Anyhow. This imperative statement is a command rooted in love and total devotion to God. The total, um, while this is spoken to the nation of Israel, to all God's children, all of the yous, all the pronouns you and yours are actually singular. This holds each person um, accountable for their response to obeying it. So there's an implied you. That's why I put in here each of you. Or you could put your own name, Annie. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is individual. A relationship with God requires an all-access pass to your heart, soul, and mind. God doesn't want to share custody of you. He wants all of you and me. If we do give him all access to us, the cool thing is that scripture promises that in return, he gives us 24-7 access back to him. The other part of this command says to love. Now, what kind of love are we talking about this? Often in church, we think love is like agape love. The cool thing that I've got out here is this is not about agape love. This is actually about desire. Love means to desire. This is um, rooted in our longings. This brings us back to the question I asked you in the beginning. What do you desire? What do you love? This text is asking us to pour out all our affection, all our desire, it says, desire the Lord above all else. To love God fully is to aim our hearts towards him. And this is an act of worship. This is worship. So the Shema continues. These commandments, and the commandments include now the whole entire Bible. These commandments I give you today are to be on your heart. Again, the emphasis centers on the heart. The place that holds our affection, desire, and love. 
It goes on to say, impress them on your children. Oh, keep going. And go next. And then next. Impress them on your children. Now that's the NIV. Then it goes on, click one more. Repeat them to your children. And another version says, teach them diligently to your children. So we see the word impress, repeat, teach. And in MomQ, we say, disciple your children. That's where it is, right there. Disciple your children. Verse 7 continues with how do we do this? It says, talk about the commandments of God, his word, when you're sitting at home, when you're walking on the road, even when you're lying down or getting up. Is there any part of the day he left off? No, this is the entire day. Intentionally, out loud, with your mouth and your words, talk and teach God's word to your children by integrating it Constantly and continually. The verse really is, uh, it just, it repeats this idea that this is a non-stop, all-encompassing action. It's not, our faith is not compartmentalized into sections of our lives or certain days. It's all the time, everywhere. The last part of verse 8 says this, tie the commands as symbols on your hands. Oops, sorry. Okay, y'all haven't gotten that yet, have you? I knew this was going to be crazy. All these blanks. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you get that last part. Integrate God's word constantly and continually. And I would also add consistently. Consistently, constantly, continually. A lot of C's there. And this may not be natural to some of us. This was not natural to me for a long time. I had to be super intentional thinking about it, and it felt a little clunky and awkward. But the more that we practice this rhythm of constantly and continually talking about God, sharing what he's done, even to people who don't believe in him, at first you might feel like, oh, I think I'm a Jesus freak. But yes, you want to be a Jesus freak. That's what this is asking you to do. All in. All right, so then the last part, the next verse, the next slide. Tie them as symbols on your hands. What do we do with our hands? Literally everything. <laughs> right? Put these on your hands. Um, we do everything. We serve. We love. We show um, everything we do is with our hands. So what we do, what comes out of our hands, should flow from God's word. What we do should flow from God's word. Then after our hands, it says we bind or wear them on our foreheads. This doesn't mean literally put the Bible on your forehead. No. <laughs> What's behind our, our foreheads, our minds, our brains? This is where God's, what we think should flow from God's word. You know, the Jewish tradition, uh, real Hasidic Jews take those little phylacteries and they put, the, they actually literally put a little box on their head and tie it and it has scripture in it. If you've ever seen that. But God's not literally asking us to do that. He's saying, hey, pay attention to your forehead. Pay attention to your mind. All right, then. So after talking about putting reminders on our hands and our foreheads, it says this. To put, uh, to write the scripture on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. In particular, this is your city gates. These are the personal door frames of your home. And the city gates refer to the public meeting places. The intent here is to make faith visible in your home and outside your home. Your faith is not just a private matter. It should be a prominent part of your life. Your family rhythms should be obviously displayed. That your heart is aimed at the kingdom of God. That your life is set apart, different from the world. Again, your life needs to be set apart and different. So in summary, the Shema is a call to worship, to make God in his kingdom the source of truth and the desire of your home. If we make his ways permeate every aspect of our families, we must integrate our faith in both our physical, emotional, and spiritual lives. We need to bring God's word into every conversation. I know that sounds crazy, but I guarantee that every conversation we have we need to bring God in with us because he's never apart from us. When we receive him, he's always with us. So why would we ignore him? 
It will be as if I, like I do sometimes with my poor husband. I'll have him and I'm having a conversation. He's like, hey, remember I'm here? Like, God's saying the same thing. Hey, remember I'm here? We got to we gotta bring him in. So, that is where that's that. <coughs> so, rituals, our habits, our routines are formative over time because they become second nature. What do I mean by that? Well, we have to work to cultivate wisdom and virtue in our children's lives because we've talked about this before. Their basic nature is sin infected. The second nature is the things we learn through practice, through the spiritual disciplines like prayer, reading the Bible, fasting, serving, confessing, fellowship. All of those things are disciplines that transform our hearts and give us the second nature. We know that Jesus... Apart from Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we cannot have the second nature. The second nature is the Holy Spirit, the power to be made new. So the Shema is clear that our desires are formed through the ordinary rhythms of our lives. Our habits are not just something we do, but they're doing something to us. Let me say that again. Our habits are not something we just do, but they are doing something to us. They are forming and shaping our desires and our loves. So, do you remember learning to drive a car? Well, my mom had a Subaru and it was a manual transition. And I would watch her take her left foot, put it over the clutch, push in while she lifted off the accelerator and then shift and then smoothly transition. And I would hear the car engine rev up and down and up. And I watched her in the club. And when I got my driver's permit, I was really queuing in. I would just observe her. I'm like, I'm going to do this. I can do this. But then when I got in the car, well, it was very clunky. There was a lot of lunging forward and back. And, you know, it, it was awkward. Then I'm having to think, who's next to me? Who's behind me? My mom's, you know, if you've taught someone to drive, you know this. You've always got your foot on the brake. You're like, does not see how close we are. But over time, we keep driving. And then... At some point, we get in our car after a long day, after a conflict or a hard situation. We have it all going through our mind, and all of a sudden we realize, oh, I'm home. How'd I get here? Second nature. Right? We've been practicing these things for so long that they become second nature. Again, keep that in your mind, this idea of second nature. Our children grow up and develop it, too, to form these unconscious habits. And these things come, both good and bad, by the rhythms that we model in our home. I call this their baseline for normal. This baseline becomes the, formate, becomes the default for their habits and requires intentional effort to reprogram as they mature into adults. We all know, we learn things from our family of origin, ways of operation, and some of those healthy and un some not so healthy. And to reprogram those, we have to be very intentional because our default goes back to those rhythms, those second nature habits that we acquired as children. So how they learn to show love and affection, how they handle emotions or conflict, disappointment. Also the lens that they're able to be grateful, humble and show grace is influenced by the rhythms in our home. We've often said at Mom Hugh, more is caught than taught. It's so true and scary. Our household rhythms, routines, and rituals really are habits, and they are formative, not just informative. So we need to pay attention. As moms, we've talked about this. We are called to be ambassadors for Christ, to represent the message, the method, and the character of Christ to our children. If we are to faithfully execute this mission, we must first start with our own hearts and align them to uh, the heart of God. And then we must consistently and continually impress, teach, repeat them to our children. So, depending on the stage of life you're in, um, that could look different. Regardless if you have toddlers or teens, um, there are many, there are four basic opportunities you have to instill some natural um, second ha nature habits to help, to help shape the desires and direction of your children's heart. So, on the back, oh, and I didn't, you know, I didn't put the big idea. Okay, here we go. The big idea is that healthy family rhythms help 
shape children's hearts to desire the kingdom. So our rhythms are shaping. We've talked about in the past how discipline is something that helps shape our kids' hearts. Rhythms. Ladies, we're in the business of heart shaping. That's just what parenting is. Everything we do is shaping their hearts. It is guiding it. It's giving them the target to aim for. So we have to be pay attention to how we're doing this. And really, in the daily rhythms, um, we have lots of opportunities. So the first one is this. The first rhythm that we encounter every day is waking up, waking, right? Waking. And we want to get in the rhythm of waking to the presence of God. Waking. Waking to the presence of God. We need to think about our habits, our morning rituals, and how we can go both how we can cultivate morning routines that wake us to the presence of God. So, my uh, suggestion, first of all, is to get on your knees first thing. Um, I think I added... Number one, begin with prayer and Bible reading. Some people say they literally get on their knees. This could be literal or figure, figurative, but as soon as your eyes open up, just start talking to God. Invite Him in. Which brings me to the second thing that I want to also incorporate with this is to the next one. Silence all media. Wake up to do not disturb on your phone. The temptation will be to start checking your messages, alerts, notifications, the latest news, what happened overnight, who texted you at 1 a.m., what did they have to say, right? No, Just keep the phone to the side, begin with prayer, set your phones to do not disturb. Go meet with the presence of God before you hear anyone else's voice. That's what I'm talking about here. The third part is this. As a mom with little kids, and I'm going to explain this one, maintain margin to go cultivate morning peace. Peace. Margin and peace. So my experience as a mom was I had a morning rhythm of hurry up and rush. It's very opposite of the word peace. I was not cultivating the presence of God in my home. I was, I was uh, really cultivating the presence of mom being a crazy lady, right? I would hit snooze, sleep as late as I could, go to bed too late, I was exhausted, wake up, yelling at everybody, get out of bed, we're late, right? Let's go, 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 right? That is the hurry and rush mom. That was not, good morning, children. So good to see you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Right? And I know what I'm saying right now. You're like, lady, that's really um, idealistic of you. But honestly, it's, it's possible. But it has to start with your intentional um, desire to be aimed at God and then to see how can my, my hands and my words follow the truth of what I say I believe. So, um, hurry and rush. So invite the Holy Spirit in, because let me just tell you this. As I've gotten older, the cool thing is um, I have established this morning routine, and yes, I don't have littles at home who are just, you know, begging me, waking me up. Um, but being able to go get in the presence of God first thing, fill up, and so that then when everyone starts coming downstairs and, and arriving, I'm in a much better place. Right? I'm not the crazy, hurry, worry, chaos mom. I'm more spirit-filled because right, I've just spent my time in the presence of the Lord. And I know that this is hard. I know. I get it. I was desperate for sleep for 20 years almost. But you can do this. I'm just going to encourage you that this rhythm of waking to the presence of the Lord will change and transform your family. It will model to your children this idea that this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I would quote that to your children. Teach your children to cultivate this rhythm as well. Pray with them in the morning. Pray, memorize scripture. If they're still at home, have time with them. Put them in a special spot. Give them their stuff and let them um, have their special time next to you as you model that. As, you, as they get school age and you're in the car, you know, pray in the car, talk about scripture. Um, when they forget their shoes at home, you know, just say, praise the Lord, we get more time together. Just turn around and go back home and get your shoes. 
you know, when you forget the lunch, praise the Lord. I get more time with you. I'm going to come see you in a few hours. Pretty much. You know? Oh, you forgot your homework. That's terrible. We get more time together to pick up that assignment. Oh, what an opportunity. I'm going to get to talk to your teacher. And, you know, I don't know. You know, transforming those moments of, again? Really? Like, how dumb can you be that you would forget your shoes when we're going to school? Um, I don't know if that ever happened to y'all, but it might have happened in my home. Um, so the goal of um, parenting is for them to ultimately take ownership of their faith. So if we get them in the habit of waking to the presence of the Lord, that could really set the tone for a lifetime ahead. A lifetime. <laughs> All right, second rhythm is mealtime. Everybody's got to eat. God built that rhythm right into our bellies. He designed us to need food several times a day. Several times we feel that growl in our stomach. Food is meant to ultimately not just remind us of our physical need, because we can't stay alive without it, but our spiritual need, our need for God. I love it. In John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. No one, no one comes to me will ever be hungry. And no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Moses reminded the Israelites at the end of their 40 years in the wilderness, um, wandering around in Deuteronomy 8.3, he said, God humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you manna to eat, which your fathers had not known. So that, and this is good, so that you might learn that man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And finally, Jesus, at the end of his 40 day uh, in the wilderness, fasting, Satan comes to him and he twists the scriptures and Jesus quotes what Moses had even told the Israelites. He says, um, you know, man does not live by bread alone. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Hunger is designed to humble us before God. So our mealtime routines and rhythms should be a time to humble ourselves, to remember that God is the provider, the sustainer, and the redeemer. My point here is meal time is it, uh, meal times are times to cultivate spiritual conversation. So, here is my sample approach at the table. Courses works differently. You know, when they when my were first born and sitting in that high chair, you know, we would hold hands and say a little prayer. Or, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do, but at some point, you are all going to be sitting around the table. The first thing you need to do is remove the electronic devices. And not just your kids, but you too. Put them on Do Not Disturb. Encourage your husband to participate with you. And put them in another room. Like, get rid of electronic devices. They're hijacking the minds of all of us. And then begin the meal with prayer. Always invite God to the table. Begin with prayer. And encourage your kids to open up prayer. And if they don't want to, you know, you do it, your husband does it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be... Thing, but we're inviting God. And then model at the table by appropriately sharing your own struggles, your spiritual struggles and victories. Whatever way that is appropriate developmentally for it, your kids, it is good to model that at these slow down times where we yield to the hunger, we stop, that we can also reflect on what God's doing in our lives. You can share what he taught you in the Bible. You can ask your kids, um, you know, what did they learn today? Where did they see God? And that's my fourth. Encourage your kids. And I, I, I don't like how I said that, but encourage them to share as well. Again, just conversation. You're cultivating a rhythm. Remember, it's going to be, it could be uncomfortable. And if your kids are teenagers already and you, you haven't practiced this, that's okay. We're still, my husband and I are still working on this rhythm of how to have spiritual conversations. So it's important to set aside all media and technology. This mealtime can be a place of worship, celebration, through this fellowship of your family. If kids are not eating their broccoli, just don't worry about it. There's a time for that, but don't let that be the main thing. The food is not the main thing. The main thing is the people at the table. Make eye contact, listen, you know? You, set, you bring the food, you bring the feast, they choose, right? You can't, you don't want to force it because again, just like the spiritual conversations, you don't want to force it down their throats. 
what we do is we model. We eat the broccoli, and we eat the Word of God, and we share. So, um, recently our family of five had a chance to sit down at the table. My two oldest came home from college for fall break. I was really excited. My husband and I have been spending the past year really working on our marriage, and there's, we're starting to realize there's some conversations we want to have with our boys. So I was really anxious to be purposeful and connect. But as the enemy would have it, and as the life would have it, everybody had different things going on. So we could literally not find one night to just sit down, the five of us, to have a meal. Um, and by the way, I had gone to the grocery store. I had planned meals. I was like, we are going to do this. But it just never worked. But but God, the morning that the boys were flying out, we had the opportunity to go to breakfast and sit around the table. And at that table, we were able to share with our boys some ways that we know that we didn't model God's love in our home. And we were able to let them express back how they, <laughs> how they experienced us. ways that they experienced us and also the ways that they have seen us be different and how God is changing us. So it was really special. And I'm not saying your meal times are all going to be like this. And I, I began to cry in a conversation with the boys. I just couldn't contain it. The regret, but also the gratitude in that moment of recognizing, Lord, you allowed the conversation. And it didn't happen um, it wasn't the first time we've sat together. It's 20 years of cultivating mealtimes as a family, 20 years of conversations. And so regardless of what those conversations are at your table, have them. And God will use them like he's doing today in our family to, um, to make them really special with my adult children, with my grown boys. It's really cool to see how all that effort of those family meals, because it's very hard to protect meals in the home. Your husbands work late, you may work late, You've got this and that and this and you know, sports and school activities. Life is busy. You have to be super intentional. So make space around the table for your family and the Lord. I love the book I was looking doing in part, as part of my research for this by Justin Early, Habits of a Household. He says that at their table, they have a tradition of bringing a candle to the table. And it's there to remind them that the light of Christ is with them, that he is what fuels their lives. And so last night, literally, it was just the three of us, because the two were away. I was like, get out the candles. I got a bunch of candles, and we lit them. And, and uh, you know, the fun part for Sam is lighting it with the blowtorch, practically. So <laughs> I was like, you know what, Lord, this is great. And I said, and I looked at Mike, and I said, I want to make this a new tradition. For us, whenever we have a meal together, I want to light a candle because I want to have a reminder, a visual cue that God is with us and that He is at, at the table. So I just encourage y'all to do that. I love that. So the third rhythm that God established from the foundation of the world is that in the creation, He made an entire day of creation and He called it the Sabbath, the day of rest. A holy day set apart once a week for rest. And enjoyment of God. This isn't a day just to sit in church and listen to, you know, the sermon. This is a day about enjoyment, rest, fellowship. God commanded the nation of Israel in Exodus 20, 8 through 10, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Holy means just set apart. Set it apart. You are to labor for six days and then do all your, and do all your work. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you or your sons or daughters, your male or female servants, your livestock, I don't know how you keep the livestock from working, but, or any resident alien who is within your gates. It's like, everybody, let's take a, a spirit-led pause and let's just remember the Lord. This rhythm is one that the Israelites actually struggled to keep. God was giving them a day of rest and they could not keep it. So much and so, it's interesting, as I read through the Bible this year, looking at the Old Testament, over and over, I was shocked that the, really the reason that God was disciplining them a lot of times was because they didn't keep the Sabbath. It's like you didn't rest. They got in trouble for that. I mean, God wasn't like, it's not because you didn't murder or steal. Or really, it's like, you didn't rest. You didn't rest. And so if you don't rest with your families, it's going to be a problem. You're going to bring chaos into your home. 
You're not going to create a rhythm of peace and joy and love. You're going to create chaos and stress and anxiety. And I'm saying that in love. The Sabbath is super important. If sports want to be every day of the week, I would encourage you to say no to that. Whatever it is, it is hard for me. I'm a doer. I want to do, do, do. Oh my God, so much time in life, right? We think of time, any time that we're not doing something, we're being unproductive, like somehow we're not contributing um, the way we should. But time is not something for us to consume. It's something for us to give back to God. Do you realize that the Sabbath, one day a week is only 15% of our time in a week? 15%. You get 85% to do whatever you want. 15 he wants from you. So, here's we go. Here's a couple practical tips. Go tech-free. Every rhythm, go tech-free. We see the, the tech, the phone, all of it, it is a distraction from the rhythms of cultivating our hearts and our desires for God. Go tech-free. Two, prioritize it on your calendar. Put on your calendar church. Put it there. That way it doesn't look like on my calendar an empty space. Oh, I have a free day. What? How can I fill it? No, put church. Oh, I've got church. Um, third, worship God by attending church. It is so important we're not meant, like at the end of the Shema, it says, put it on your door frames and the city gates. We're not meant to compartmentalize our faith just in our homes. We're meant to join in community. And then last, enjoy God's present and his gift of your family. Your family is a gift from God. And let me just tell you, your littles are only with you for a very short time. It is so true that the days are long, but the years are short. It's crazy how fast it goes. It's, it's like, wow. So I know it feels like a lot. Embrace it. Every Sunday you get with a family, say, we get to be together today. We get to do this. This is a get to, not a have to. God gave us the Sabbath on purpose. All right, and the fourth and final rhythm is bedtime. It's my favorite. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I love nighttime. I love when the sun goes down and everything calms down. The dark comes over and the quiet sounds outside. I get to take off all these uncomfortable clothes and get comfy. Pull my hair back and just take the makeup off. I, I love nighttime because all the expectations of the world kind of settle down. So, I want to encourage you to make your nighttime routines a time of settling their hearts. I didn't put this on here, but the first thing should be remove all like, electronic devices. Do not give your kids iPads. And I say that again with love. Do not put your kids to bed with an electronic device. I've heard this is happening, and it's shocking and terrifying. A whole other talk is on the dangers of electronic devices, but you are inviting that you are inviting evilness, evil spirits into your home when you give them that device at night. So take away that. First thing is be present at bedtime and listen. Just get ready to listen. Prepare your heart to just be listening with your kids. Listen to them. Not just physically present, but listen to their hearts. Listen for those little things that they say that you can, can kind of get curious about. Two, regularly take time for storytelling and Bible reading at night. When I homeschool, but often heard kids want to be read to even through 18 years old. Like, we all love to be read to. If I sat here and read you a story right now, you'd be like, oh, this is nice. <laughs> right? I love to be read to. Read with your kids. Find books and stories that reinforce the wisdom, the virtues, the things that you want to instill in your kids. Listen to their impressions. What, did, what stuck out to them? Talk about it. And then finally, end with praying. Praying out loud with your kids. If they can learn a rhythm of prayer in their life daily, in the morning, at meals, on the Sabbath, and at night, that will become a second nature language for them. Right? So many people say, I don't like praying out loud. It's uncomfortable. It's scary. Right? Don't give your children the courage to pray with others because it's a beautiful way that as a body of Christ we can encourage and we can come alongside someone 
And comfort them is when we bring God into our conversations through prayer. Practice praying. If you're not comfortable with it, the best place to learn is with your little kids. They're not judging you. Right? So you practice praying and let them. You'll be amazed at the things they say. So there are so many other rhythms we can talk about um, that we can take advantage in our day. But these are just four that um, came to mind that we have time to discuss today. Remember that the norms of their childhood, the second nature behaviors, these rhythms and rituals that we're instilling in them, will stick with them through adulthood. This will be the baseline with which they build their families. This could... And t this could impact generations to come. It's that important. So as we build our family rhythms around conversations about God, the desire of our hearts will be aimed at his kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we're just so grateful that you, um, that you gave us the rhythms of nature that guide uh, the days of our lives and our, with our children as we watch them grow into the men and women you've designed them to be. Lord, help us all to shepherd their hearts towards you, to, um, God, change our hearts to desire you so that that's what we model in our conversation, in our actions, in our service. God, we just pray right now that you would give wisdom to our mentor moms as they encourage these moms, and um, God, we just love you. In Jesus' name, <coughs> amen.